Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. Today we have here with us Robert. Hello. Myself, Ash, and a very special guest. He's a very prominent dentist in the Austin area of Texas. And very appropriately here because we will be talking about relationship-based dentistry in today's episode. Now, Dr. Robin Bethel has actually accomplished a lot in a very short time. He's been in practice as a dentist for over a decade And on Google reviews, he's got almost five stars with several hundred reviews. And that is part of the reason why we have here with us today. So he can share some of the ways he has achieved that great success in his practice and his uh, various locations in his Austin area. And I might also add that Dr. Bethel has multiple locations uh, in the Austin area. So it's uh, more than just one practice. It's actually uh, four if you count them all. So... With that, I'll, I'll let uh, you start out, or, or I'll just start out by asking a question. You know, Robin, we want to talk about relationship dentistry, and why don't you explain what that is? Absolutely. Well, hello, Beyond Bite Wings world and all fans of dental accounting and dental things. <laughs> what is relationship dentistry, and how do patients get so much uh, joy out of dental appointments, they write five-star reviews. Is that kind of the, the, the topic du jour? That's really it because, you know, the, the word is that people hate going to the dentist and, and you've had such great success in such a short period of time, you must be doing something differently than the majority of the people out there. Yeah, well, certainly I recognize early on in 2012 when we opened Forest Family in Old Austin. It's in the north part where, you know, people... I consider that the old town Austin days and confused was filmed over here and it's kind of still weird. We opened up knowing that reviews mattered and I have always understood dentistry as a profession. That's all about people. We're in the service industry. I came out terrified and very naive about finances and accounting. I'm super thankful to the Edwards team because I'm like, I didn't know how much it would cost. I didn't know how much to set aside for marketing, et cetera. But I did know that people read reviews and it was a time of, of Yelp. And I knew that people who would write a review about an office would do so if they felt like the people, their dentists cared about them. Our whole goal and my mission for our small team at the time was to get people to say thank you. And we reverse engineered what other dental offices in in Austin were doing to get five-star reviews. And we put all the conveniences in our very inexpensive office. We know it's crazy how much a small flat screen TV on the ceiling that shows Netflix (laughs) will get you five-star Yelp reviews versus versus a $35,000 ADAC chair. You know, patients don't care so much about that. But it really was about the the interpersonal skills and and talking to people and forming these bonds. And our script was when someone says, thank you, we say it would mean the world to us if you told your friends and family. So the people who wrote Yelp reviews and Yelp was big in Austin, they knew what that meant. And um, they would go online and, and write a, you know, 500 word essay about their experience of the dentist. And that was our number one KPI. Our number one goal was to get, five-star reviews. And that has worked very well for you. I think that's translated over into the Google reviews of today. And I think one thing that a lot of people have problems with is, is, you know, the doctor may think like you do, but his staff doesn't perform like yours does. So what would you attribute that to? 
Well, I mean, it's everything. I mean, having great people is, is the whole gig. I, you know, as we've gotten bigger, we have, you know, four locations now and Austin is become way more challenging. I mean, it's on a scale multiples more than, you know, four offices having to find great people and develop a great culture. Back then it was, you know, five or six of us and it was all about these people to me. And so we knew that the weakest person, you know, can be corrosive to a culture. We just hired people pretty fast and, and, and fired just as fast if they weren't the right fit. And we just grew this group of people starting with very few and promoted within and, and, you know, try to establish this culture that everyone bought into and believed in. And now, you know, nine years later, we have leaders and people in, in my business that understand what the culture is and, and can share that with the new members as we grow. So it's not even about me anymore. It's more about these other key people. And I know when you started your first practice, I was impressed because you, I think you reached a, a million dollar practice in, in maybe a little over a year. And that at the time that was unheard of. And I kept asking you how you did that. And, and, and ordinarily, you know, when doctors do that, they're running patients through the chair as quick as they can see them. Uh, and that wasn't your approach at all, was it? No, not at all. I didn't know how I did it either. I remember you asking me that and I was like, I don't, I made a million dollars. I didn't even know it. It's my accounting team to tell me that that was accomplished. And yeah, no, it was, it was just putting my head down and continuing to try to work hard. And I had some skills. I could do a very a variety of procedures. And uh, I think when you form a bond with a patient, they value the you know services you provide. And so people said yes to treatment early on. And when you have a good reputation uh, online, I think that people are more willing to trust you. And, you know, I had a aspiring dentist. She was a receptionist. Uh, her name is Audrey. At the time, she, you know, was just working part time while she applied to dental school. And she was very ambitious and she pushed me and she was like, we can do better. We can do more. We can add associate. We can expand these chairs. And, and I was like, Oh, are you ready? I don't know. And I just kind of trusted her and she pushed and she set goals and she motivated team and she pushed. And before long, we were a very productive team with generating, you know, our, our Anderson lane office is doing about 4 million annually now. And pre COVID we were doing 4 million. We're hopefully be back there this year. And Audrey's still with me today. She ended up not, not applying to dental school and she's our, our, we call her a COO. So she's, you know, makes sure that our culture is what it is. And she's integrates all these ideas, all the different various departments in our team and it's the right people. When you said your Anders Lane office is doing about 4 million and, and, and like I said before, you have four offices. So it's a fairly good size organization. So you need a COO. You need more than just an office manager. You need somebody like that that's actually invested and driven to help make things work. And and I, I assume that that just makes it so much easier on you. And, but it, again, it, it all goes back to creating those relationships with your patients because that way I don't think they dread coming to see you. They actually look forward to it, don't they? You know, I, when I hear someone say that, I'm like, are you serious? You really look forward to this? You know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> we do get the occasional person that loves coming here and, and you know, really enjoys when it's their six-month visit. And that's, that, I mean, I it's a cliche, but it does mean the world to me. It makes me proud to be a dentist. So well, maybe we can tell a few of our listeners about the whole process of how it works. As in, let's say, if a patient walks through the doors, who's the first person they see? Uh, what kind of an experience they have while they're waiting or while they're, you know, filling out paperwork to the point where they go and sit on the chair. Just the whole process, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that goes on and maybe it's been going on for so many years that maybe it's, it's been, it's being taken for granted, but, you know, people from outside can see that you and your team are doing something amazing. And maybe there's something that our fellow listeners can learn. Absolutely. You know, I think there's a lot of different ways to do the patient intake and everything. There's no wrong way. No, mm -hmm. you know, our, our purpose and our stated purpose early on was to be efficient, convenient, enjoyable, and affordable. 
quality wasn't even in there. That's not one. I mean, we don't use the highest quality labs in town. We take in network insurance. So we want to be high quality, but I was a young dentist. I didn't, I couldn't compare myself to some of these guys that have been here in Austin for 20, 30 years that are expertly trained and I was still learning. So we, we, we wanted to be convenient. So the first thing about our, our office is we do a lot of online appointment scheduling and we have, we're open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day. And uh, we are in network with every insurance that's PPO that's offered by major employers here in town. So we, we try to be as convenient as possible to everybody. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the most important delineation from our style versus, say, the dentist down the street. I see. And I think that's what brought us a lot of people early on. When a patient comes into our office, you know, I don't know, it looks like a dental office to me. It's been described as aggressively hipster. <laughs> it's, like, it's like cork floors and it was me you know and mm. i was in my late 20s and you know i it reclaimed wood furniture it was a very inexpensive build out i mean i the building we're in and i'm sitting in right now was built in the 60s it used to be this east medicine training center it's wow. really weird not like your typical dental office build out but it appeals to the people in Austin, I would think. Well, and I didn't know there was anything in Austin that was built in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's an old style building. And it does appeal to Austin people. It appealed to me. And, you know, it was mm-hmm. not, we, we had a dental practice demographics person we hired. And they told me all the places to go in Austin. And I went to the place they told me not to go to. <laughs> and it's in the heart of competition. And, you know, it was unadvisable. And. The way we found it, it, I'm not genius at locating a practice. I wasn't genius in building out a practice. You're I was modest. just afraid of spending too much money. All the, I think that that my skills was in understanding what my market and my community wanted. Mm-hmm. And then reverse engineering that into a dental office. Yeah, and I agree and creating- with a lot of what you said there because... You know, we've seen so many startups. We've probably seen, I don't know, 400 startups over the last 20 years. And I saw yours. And and as you know, I constantly ask you, what is it that you're doing differently? Because you did look at it. You approached it differently than anybody else I think I've ever seen. Because you tried to understand the market, what they wanted. And then you gave them that. And that's not the way that the, the average startup works. So you've done a great job. I really appreciate that. And, and thank you. You know, I, I think that I, you know, I, we built several other offices afterwards. We've improved on every single one, you know, everyone gets a little better and I, I budget better, but this original one, it truly was, you know, is champagne on a beer budget. And it was, <laughs> it was trying to reverse engineer every positive and negative Yelp review of all my competitors. Like, don't do the things that led to negative reviews Mm -hmm. and do all the things that got positive reviews and then figure out this crazy insurance game, which I still struggle with, still don't fully understand it and struggle. We have people in our, in our business now that understand it way better than me, thankfully. Well, one reason I think it's so hard to understand is because they change the rules all the time. And you change the rules all the time. And you know, what we're looking at right now is really scary because we see inflation going up like crazy. Everything, the cost of a cotton roll, the cost of, you know, our disposables going up, the employee rates. I mean, we're paying our employees more than we've ever paid them, but insurance rates aren't going and reimbursement rates aren't going up at all. And so how do we, how do we adjust? You know, do we drop insurances? Do we, you know, adapt new billing procedures, renegotiate rates? There's all these different strategies and that's, that's scary. Yeah, I think you have to do a little bit of all of the above. Right. (laughs) But what's what's the one biggest single thing that you see happening between your doctors and yourself and 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 your patients as far as the relationship? Well, so now we there's 14 doctors in our group. It's a, that's a really hard question to answer. I every doctor that comes in here, I see them as you know, they're independent. They're there they're themselves. I hire them based off of personality traits less than I do about, you know, what skills they have. I hope that they love dentistry and want to continue to learn great skills, but we have like 14 very different dentists. 
And my job, and I see this as my purpose towards, uh, you know, my associates, my job is to keep them busy and to keep people coming to our practice. And the only way we can keep people coming to our practice is to continue to have a great reputation. So I have to, you know, hire great people and, and, and continue promoting a culture in our company that makes people want to say thank you and enjoy being here. And their job is to be productive, number one. And number two, their job is to maintain our cultural standards. So I have to constantly repeat what those standards are, what my expectations are and how we talk to people, how we present treatment, how we you know, talk to our coworkers. And it doesn't go, a month doesn't go by where I have some sort of problem with a doctor's cultural, you know, impact on the team. Dentists are not particularly skilled at dealing with people. I, so, they, um, they must be better than accountants. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys are great. I've always enjoyed talking with you guys. No, you know, it's probably very similar. I think that, I think that dentists are, you know, used to working in small spaces, very high, you know, you guys are working with numbers. We're working with millimeters and it's, you know, it, it, not, you know, the big people skills, the emotional intelligence is not high amongst our, our colleagues. So I see. Now, the one big thing that you kept on mentioning during our episode was culture, maintaining a culture. So, and then, you know, you having some set standards for maintaining that culture. What are some of the ways you achieve that? Do you have like weekly meetings with your team or every day or once a month? How do you implement those standards and how do you enforce that those standards are being maintained? Man, I'm, I'm a hard critic on myself. I don't <laughs> think I'm the best at this. You know, I have to communicate these standards repeatedly and in different ways so that people understand them and hear them. And, you know, we, I check certain boxes, you know, we mm -hmm. do have monthly meetings. Mm -hmm. our, our company now we have 90 people. Wow. 90. It's insane. And so getting, a, <laughs> getting 90 people on the same boat, heading in the same direction is, mm -hmm. it is a Challenge. big task. Mm -hmm. And I really, I can't manage more than, you know, five or six people, let alone 90. And so really what it is, is consistent mes messaging, having clear standards, it starts, you know, an employment manual and hiring and training early on. And you try to develop those standards and then monthly meetings, we repeat some of them. I don't think it's interesting because it, I think a lot of dentists get really upset when people don't do what they want them to do. You know, mm -hmm. they expect everyone to adapt this cultural standards or adapt your purpose and values really quick. And I, my expectations aren't that people are going to get it. No one really cares as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't expect them to, it's not their business. I own it. They don't. Mm -hmm. And we just repeat it. And I, I repeat it all the time. And my, if I, if I'm going to say it, I better act on it. I better behave like our standards. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it, the way that we get all these people to follow this culture is it's constant. It's for repetition. It's me being as predictable and, and, and following these standards as I can. And I'm not predictable. I'm all over the place, but I, I certainly try to abide by these values and we just continue to be better than we were yesterday. It's we're, we're you know, it's lowering my expectations of people Mm -hmm. and believing they're giving their best and every day being better than they were before. Now, Robin, is this something that you've developed on your own or have you had consultants come in at various different times and work with your group to help you develop these processes and procedures? That's a great question. No, we've never had a consultant come in, but we know at this size right now, I'm, I'm open to it. I really, I think that we, we could benefit from somebody helping me communicate with 90 people. I could do it when we were smaller, as we get bigger, it's much harder. And, but no, it's never been consulted. I, you know, I, I think that these are things that I found valuable from people I respected outside of our industry. And there's some influences I listen to podcasts and, you know, follow certain individuals and I believe in their business philosophies. Well, as I said earlier, I think you're being modest because as you may remember, it's been a few years because I finally gave up, but I think I offered several times to have you maybe mentor some of our other clients because you're doing things that they only strive to do. And I, I see the results being so much better 
for you and your group than it is for them. And then some of them are struggling and, and more so now after the pandemic, but you just seem to have it down. I, I love that you think that <laughs> <laughs> I, I think part of it is I'll never have it down. I'll never, I'll never have a full, you know, grasp on our culture and having everyone in line. Well, and I think that that's the other thing. I think you're always striving to, to get better. And so that that's, I mean, that's great. That's, that's and I'm uh, not, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just not hard on myself. It's just, it's, it's, we're never going to be perfect, but we're just trying to get better every time. I think a lot of dentists, they get, they get really upset because things aren't perfect. I think they beat themselves up about it and they may overthink things. And it's, you know, it's, you what? don't have to have everything perfect. You don't have to do the best employment manual and the best protocol set up. I certainly do not. Well, and what's that, people, what's that book called? Uh, don't sweat the little things. That's right. Don't sweat the small <laughs> stuff. Really. Yeah. I think that, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. Now our, our protocols are getting better and they have to, as we get bigger. Sure. Um, but sure. When you're starting out, it's the big things that matter. You know, I've actually heard of this Japanese discipline. I can't remember the exact name, maybe shokunin or something. I think that's what Dr. Bethel implements, you know, always constantly striving for perfection, but fully understanding that you'll never achieve it or understanding like that. that you're never going to achieve it, but always working towards it. Yeah. So that's great. You, you actually had a lot of great tips, pointers, and, you know, you did uh, mention that your team had a lot to do with it as well. And of course, you know, you and your genius ideas. Now, Dr. Bethel is very humble. I'm sure the audience and the listeners can tell, but he has achieved a lot. And, you know, during this episode, he's actually mentioned a lot of things, little things. So, you know, please feel free to take notes. And at any point, if you guys have questions, please reach out to us. Our email is info at e and And yeah. we look forward to, you know, listening to other questions that you guys have. And Dr. Bethel, thank you again for being oh, here with us. And in your audience, if they have questions, I'm all over the internet. They can just look me up. Ah, and see, there you <laughs> go. Great. <laughs> well, we, and, we uh, will we'll let you know if uh, we get some feedback, and, and I'm sure we will have uh, some questions for you in the in the future. And thanks so much thank for agreeing you. to be here today. Yes, thank Good you. Good luck with uh, PPP and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> We're going to need you. it. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bethel. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.